Vector blur is similar to other compound blurs in that it looks at a second grayscale layer to determine how to blur the layer it is applied to. However, it's a little bit different. Rather than just looking at a grayscale value, such as saying, well, this area gets blurred 5 pixels and that area gets blurred 10 pixels, it looks for patterns in that grayscale image, what directions gradients are going in, and that affects what direction it blurs the original image that it's applied to. Okay, I know that doesn't make a lot of sense. It's much better to see it in action. Here I have an image that I want to apply vector blur to, my lion, and here I have a series of different grayscale maps that I'd like to try for the vector blur. Very centered looking image there, top to bottom drips, random clouds and fog, an oval mask, and this is very interesting, we'll be spending some time with this one later, a simple radial gradient, and some animated bars, along with an animated fractal pattern. A lot of different things to play with. I'm going to select the footage that I want to be blurred and apply Effect, Blur and Sharpen, CC Vector Blur. CC means it's part of the Psychor effects that come bundled with After Effects. There's Vector Blur, and for my vector map, I'm going to go ahead and pick that horizontal pattern we saw earlier. That's what it looked like for reference. Now, as I start to increase the amount, you can see what's going on. Rather than just blurring the image, there is some directionality to this underlying layer. It's causing the tiger to be pulled apart. If I blur in the negative direction, you'll see it actually pulls the tiger inward rather than outward. So it's the direction of these gradients that affect the direction that the underlying layer is getting pulled in or getting blurred in. I'll set it to a positive value, like 100 for now. Soft, blurry layers do make your best maps for compound effects and compound blurs in general. If your underlying layer is not that soft, you can use either map softness to blur out the map. You see if the map's not blurred, you get a lot of noise in your patterning. So some blurring of the map is a good idea. And you can use ridge smoothness to smooth out the transitions in the map so you don't get quite as sharp or sudden of a pulling of the image. Angle offset further modifies that underlying grayscale map. You'll see by increasing it, that I get a bit of a rotation and tearing to my pattern. And I'll undo. There's also additional types. Natural is a good starting point, but you'll see you'll get other patterns. Basically how it's determining the vectors in the underlying blur gradients. There's constant length. You'll see the result with perpendicular. It looks very much like the underlying blur map. And here's some other directional types as well. But I'll keep using natural as a good starting point. Let's look at what some of the other blur maps would look like. You remember Drippy had this black to white top to bottom pattern. I'll select it for my vector map. And you'll see I've got a lot of drippiness and pouring and like melting paint in my underlying layer. It's a very cool way of abstracting it. Fog was a random cloud pattern and it generally is darker at the top and lighter at the bottom. Turn that off. You'll see fog now creates as if you're looking through a very wet surface or like a very crinkled glass, like what you would typically see in say a bathroom. Another very nicely abstracted image. Grunge oval is interesting. Black on the outside, white on the inside, gray transitions and just in these areas, and it's these transitions that Vector Blur is looking for. So I turn off that map and select Grunge Oval. You'll notice the outside and the inside, the black area and the white area are not blurred. Just this transition zone from black to white is what's getting Vector Blur. And again, you can go ahead and smooth this out with a little bit of ridge smoothness, or even play around with different blur types to just change the effect. This is a very good image to see what happens with things like direction center. You'll see that by default, it pushes in one direction for white, pushes in another direction for black, and the transition zone has its own effect. And there's direction fading, kind of a softer version of that. I'll go ahead and reset these back to zero and to natural. And we've got a couple other simple things. You'll remember that we had a radial ramp shape, very simple white to black gradient. Select that, and you'll see, in essence, I've got a constant blur pulling out on beyond the edge of any change in the gradient. Again, kind of fun, and you can go ahead and smooth that out to smooth the effect, or even create an animation out of it. If you have an animated layer, such as these bars that are moved back and forth, well, that's going to result in an animated blur effect. 
I'll choose auto bars as my vector map. You'll see that in these areas, we have some blurring going on. And as I preview, different treatments are happening to the underlying layer. This can get unpredictable depending on what your blur map is. Like this is an animated fractal, black and white. And again, it's those gray areas that create interesting transitions. Go ahead and select fractal noise. You'll see that anything that's pure black or pure white is not getting blurred. It's just those animated areas that have grayscale that are causing vector blur to actually do something. Finally, you can go ahead and pick the layer itself to go ahead and blur it. And now you see some interesting, again, sort of pebbled or patterned glass effect based on the underlying layer. You can smooth that out to go ahead and create not as drastic of an image. Now you'll see I'm getting the lion's eyes and its nose and its mouth back by smoothing the underlying blur layer. And you can play around with other things like angle offset, different types of blur patterns, depending on what sort of treatment that you want. And that's vector blur, a different type of compound blur effect. Rather than blurring pixels based on the underlying grayscale values, it looks at the direction of change in those grayscale values to determine what direction to blur the image is supplied to.